Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 6th May 2019. The list of articles which has been chosen for today's analysis along with the page numbers of Chennai, Bengaluru, Thiruvananthapuram and Delhi editions are provided here. The handwritten notes in the PDF format and the time stamping has been provided in the description box. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the time stamping has also been provided in the comment section. Moving on to the first article for the day, which is about the maternal mortality rate. This article has appeared on page 5 in Delhi edition and in page 6 of Thiruvananthapuram edition. The analysis of this news article will be helpful in your prelims preparation under current events of national importance and under economic and social development and in social sector initiatives. And in main syllabus, it is important under GS paper 2 in the area issues relating to development and management of social sector or services relating to health. The news article talks about the Telangana state which is addressing the maternal mortality rate and C-section delivery reduction. This is done by posting 30 certified midwives in 12 government healthcare facilities in a week which have recorded a high number of deliveries. C-section means cesarean section where a child is given birth through surgery. In this context, you need to know what is meant by maternal mortality rate. As per World Health Organization, maternal mortality rate refers to the number of maternal deaths per 1 lakh live births due to cases related to pregnancy, that is, death while pregnant or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy. And it is regardless of the site or duration of pregnancy, where site refers to the location of the pregnant woman. The Millennium Development Goal of United Nations for Maternal Mortality Ratio was to reduce it by three quarters between 1990 and 2015. India successfully achieved this target by 2014. India had a maternal mortality ratio of 556 in the year 1990, but it was drastically reduced to 130 by the year 2014, which is almost a 77% reduction. Next, you need to know Sustainable Development Goal of United Nations for Maternal Mortality Ratio, which is covered in SDG 3 and it is ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Under this goal, we have target 3.1 and this target 3.1 mentions that by 2030, global maternal mortality ratio should be reduced to less than 70 per 1 lakh live births. Moving on, also try to know the top 5 performers and bottom 5 performers of meeting the maternal mortality ratio targets. The top 5 performers are the states of Kerala, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana in India. Telangana state which is today's focus is the state with the 5th lowest maternal mortality ratio in India. The bottom 5 performers in maternal mortality ratio are the states of Assam, Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand, Rajasthan, Odisha and Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. This list is based on the latest available data on maternal mortality ratio which is 2014. In that Kerala is the best performing state with 46 deaths per 1 lakh live births and Assam is the worst performing state with 237 deaths per 1 lakh live births. The definition and the latest available statistics will be helpful in preliminary as well as mains preparation. Let us move on to the discussion of the news article now. We saw that the Telangana government has trained 30 midwives. These midwives have been trained to recognize and handle emergency situations. The training course was funded by the central government through the national health mission and was implemented by government of Telangana in, in collaboration with United Nations Children's Fund that is UNICEF. Along with handling emergency situations, the midwives have also been trained to focus on respectful maternity, which involves the following. The midwives have been trained to treat the pregnant woman with respect, ensure their privacy during diagnostic tests and delivery, and they would also allow pregnant women to choose their birth positions. According to World Health Organization's Global Strategic Directions for Strengthening Nursing and Midwifery 2016-2020, there is a demonstrable evidence substantiating the contribution of the nursing and midwifery workforce to health improvements, which consequently contributes to patients' well-being and safety. Some of the evidences show increased patient satisfaction, decrease in patient morbidity and mortality, other hospital-related conditions including hospital-acquired infections and finally stabilization of financial systems for the patients through decreased hospital readmissions and decreased length of stay. 
with this we come to the end of this analysis the displayed prelims question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next discussion which is based on an editorial about the cyclone fani and the preparedness of the odisha government in managing the natural disaster this editorial article has appeared on page 8 in all the four editions the article will be helpful in your prelims preparation under the area current events of national importance and in indian physical geography and in main syllabus it will be helpful in general studies paper 1 under the areas salient features of world's physical geography important geophysical phenomena such as cyclone and also in gs paper 3 under area disaster and disaster management stepping into the main discussion the author states that the management of cyclone fani has emerged as a global example that a timely weather alerts preparedness and informed public participation can dramatically reduce loss of lives the management of this extreme weather event has got recognition from united nations organizations while there were severe material losses damages to houses electricity and telecommunications infrastructure the losses of lives to dead 34 that is 34 people have died because of this extremely severe cyclone the author states this is a dramatic transformation from the loss of over 10000 lives in 1999 when a super cyclone known as 05b struck odisha in 1999 from then onwards the state government of odisha has worked on upgrading the preparedness and as a result it was able to bring down the number of casualty to 44 when a very severe cyclonic storm fell in struck the state in 2013 you would have noted that the author called cyclone fani as extremely severe and cyclone felin as very severe and cyclone 05b as super cyclone in this context let us know at what point it is wiser to call cyclonic disturbance as depression or a deep depression or a super cyclone this classification can be done based on wind speed an area of low pressure with a mean surface wind speed less than 31 km per hour is called a low pressure area and depression is a cyclonic disturbance with a maximum sustained surface wind speed between 31 and 49 km per hr if it is from 50 to 61 km per hr then it is called as deep depression if the maximum average surface wind speed is in the range of 62 to 88 km per hr then it is called as a cyclonic storm when it is from 89 to 117 km per hr it is called as severe cyclonic storm a cyclonic disturbance in which the maximum average surface wind speed is from 118 to 166 km per hr it is called as very severe cyclonic storm a very severe cyclonic storm becomes an extremely severe cyclonic storm when the associated wind speed is more than 166 km per hr and until a maximum wind speed of 221 km per hr for a cyclonic disturbance to be called as a super cyclone the maximum wind speed should be greater than or equal to 222 km per hr that is why the author was particular in the nature of cyclones associated with the name so now we understood why the cyclonic storm fani is called as an extremely severe cyclonic storm now after the devastating effects of fani the odisha state government and the central government must rebuild the damaged infrastructure as quick as possible while rebuilding focus must be given to prevent future losses by upgrading technology and by building resilience to extreme weather events for this the central government shall press for global environmental funding from appropriate un framework for rebuilding the priority in rebuilding infrastructure should be given to restoring electricity and telecommunications which shall be treated as a national mission and then public health interventions must be made to prevent disease outbreaks also Regarding how to prepare for future the author states that the preparedness to such extreme events should focus on building resilience and strengthening adaptation to such events this can be achieved through better designed houses and cyclone shelters good early warning systems which is the key to better management periodic drills and financial risk reduction through insurance also The author concludes by saying that the management of cyclone fani in Odisha which happened in India and devastating cyclones that is cyclone Idai and cyclone Kenneth which affected Mozambique this year in March and April respectively will be the leading point of discussion in the upcoming UN disaster risk reduction conference which will be held at Geneva coming Monday that is May 13 2019 with this we come to the end of this discussion the displayed practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next article for the day which is about the anti dumping duty on saccharin 
and this article has appeared on page 7 in all the four editions. The information under this discussion will be relevant in the preliminary examination under the areas current events of national importance and economic development and in the main syllabus under GS paper 2 in the areas government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and next in effect of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on India's interests and also in GS paper 3 under the area Indian economy. Stepping onto the main discussion, the news article talks about the anti-dumping duty which has been imposed on saccharin imported from Indonesia. This was imposed by the finance ministry on the recommendations of the Ministry of Commerce. An anti-dumping duty of $1633 per ton has been imposed. Until recently, Indonesia accounted for a large part of India's saccharin imports. In 2017-18, to 18, India imported 43% of its total imports of saccharin from Indonesia. However, imports from Indonesia have declined since then. Such as in the period April 2018 to February 2019, India imported only 20% of its total imports from Indonesia. This anti-dumping duty has been imposed as the domestic industry, that is the industries producing saccharin in India has suffered material injury. Now to understand the news article completely, let us know about dumping, anti-dumping duty and saccharin. Dumping in general is a situation of international price discrimination, where the price of a product when sold in the importing country is less than the price of that product in the market of the exporting country. Thus, in the simplest of cases, one identifies dumping simply by comparing prices in two markets. Let us take one example to understand this. A product X is imported by India from a company of a country A. Assume that if the price of the product X sold by company in India is rupees 100, but the product's price in country A, that is in its own country, is rupees 110, then this amounts to dumping. The World Trade Organization allows governments to act against dumping where there is a genuine material injury to the competing domestic industry. In order to do that, the government has to be able to show that dumping is taking place and then calculate the extent of dumping. That is how much lower the export price is compared to the exporter's home market price. And then sh they have to show that the dumping is causing injury or threatening to do injury to the domestic market. So in this line, many governments take action against dumping in order to defend their domestic industries and this is done by imposing an anti-dumping duty. In India, an anti-dumping investigation is carried out. This is administered by the Director General of Anti-Dumping and Allied Duties, in short DGAD, which is functioning under the Department of Commerce in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And this administration is headed by the designated authority. The designated authority's function is only to conduct the anti-dumping duty investigation and make recommendation to the government for imposing of anti-dumping duty. Such duty is finally imposed or levied by a notification of the Ministry of Finance. Thus, while the designated authority in the Department of Commerce recommends the anti-dumping duty, it is the Department of Revenue under Ministry of Finance which levies such duty. The anti-dumping duty shall remain in force for a period of five years from the date of imposition of duty. However, such duty can be reviewed by the designated authority any time before the expiry of the said period. The levy of anti-dumping duty is both exporter specific and country specific, like in the case of saccharin imported from Indonesia, which is country specific. It would not apply to goods imported from a 100% export oriented units, that is EOU, and units in free trade zones and in SECs, that is special economic zones. The purpose of anti-dumping duties in general is to eliminate dumping which is causing injury to the domestic industry and to re-establish a situation of open and fair competition in the Indian market which is in the general interest of the country. The imposition of anti-dumping duty would remove the unfair advantages gained by the overseas exporters through their dumping practices and it would prevent the decline of the domestic industry and would create conditions for fair trade. And further, the imposition of anti-dumping measures would not restrict imports from the subject country in any way and therefore it would not hinder the consumer's access to the imported goods also. But there is one disadvantage, that is the imposition of anti-dumping duty might affect the price levels of the products manufactured using the subject goods. However, fair competition in the Indian market will not be reduced by the anti-dumping measures as we saw earlier. Now let us know some facts about saccharin also. 
Saccharin is a non-nutritive sweetener and considered to be a low calorie substitute for cane sugar. It is a white crystalline powder form and is odorless. Saccharin is more than 500 times sweeter than sugar. Saccharin can be divided into two types that is soluble and insoluble saccharin and it has two physical forms that is granular and powder. Sodium saccharin is in granular form which is used in a situation where saccharin will be dissolved and in powder form which has been grounded and sprayed dried is used in dry mixes and pharmaceuticals. Saccharin can be used for a variety of industries such as food beverages, personal care products, tabletop sweeteners, electroplating brighteners etc. The difference in saccharin used for industrial purposes and saccharin for food beverages is the purity of the saccharin. With this we come to the end of this discussion. The practice prelims questions which has been displayed here will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next article for the day which is about Samagra Shiksha Abhyan. This news article has appeared in page 3 of Thiruvananthapuram edition only. The analysis of this news article will be helpful in prelims preparation under current events of national importance and under social development and social sector initiatives. And in your mains preparation in general studies paper 2 under government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation and also under issues relating to development and management of social sector or social services relating to education in particular. The news article discusses about the panel nod for draft plan of Samagra Siksha Abhyan in the state of Kerala. So the other contents in the news article can be left out. From the examination point of view, we shall only focus on Samagra Siksha Abhyan. Samagra Siksha Abhyan was announced as a centrally sponsored scheme in the union budget of 2018 to 19. It was introduced as a holistic program for school education sector covering from preschool to class 12th. Samagra Siksha Abhyan has subsumed three existing schemes which are Sarva Siksha Abhyan, Rashtriya Madhyamik Siksha Abhyan and Teacher Education. Introduction of this holistic program will help India to meet the sustainable development goal number 4, especially the target 4.1 and 4.5. Here sustainable development goal number 4 is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. The vision of Samagra Siksha Abhyan is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education from preschool to senior secondary stage in accordance with the sustainable development goal which we just saw. This program will be implemented by Department of School Education and Literacy which comes under the Ministry of Human Resources and Development. The major objectives of this scheme are as follows. The first objective is to provide quality education and enhancing learning outcomes of students. The second objective is to bridge social and gender gaps in school education, thereby ensuring equity and inclusion at all levels of school education. The next, the next objective is promoting vocationalization of education, that is making the education more practical and making the students readily available for technical employment. And the next objective is to support all the states in implementation of right of children to free and compulsory education act of 2009, that is the RTE act of 2009. The final objective is strengthening and upgradation of SCERTs, that is the state councils of education research and training, and then state institutes of education, and finally DIET which is District Institute of Education and Training as nodal agencies for teacher training. We saw in the very first that Samagra Siksha Abhyan will be implemented as a centrally sponsored scheme. Centrally sponsored schemes are those schemes that are implemented in states by respective state governments but are largely funded by central government. The ratio varies from state to state based on the center's prerogative. For Samagra Siksha Abhyan, there are three funding patterns decided by the central government. The fund sharing pattern for the scheme between center and states is at present in the ratio of 90 is to 10 for the eight northeastern states which are Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, Sikkim and Tripura and then three Himalayan states which are Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. This Samagra Shiksha Abhyan is 100% centrally sponsored for union territories without legislature and the funding pattern is 60 is to 40 for all other states and union territories with legislature. Finally, 
The budgetary allocation for Samagra Siksha Abhyan is given here, which will be helpful in writing mains answer. The revised estimate in the previous financial year, that is 2018-19, to 19, is 30,781 crores. The budget estimate for the current financial year for Samagra Siksha Abhyan is fixed at 36,322 crores. One can see an increase of 5,541 crores in the budgetary allocation this year, which is almost 18% increase. With this, we come to the end of the analysis of the news article. The display prelims question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next article, which is about interoperable criminal justice system. This article has appeared on page 5 of Bengaluru edition only. The analysis of this news article will be helpful in your prelims preparation under current events of national importance and under Indian polity and governance. And in mains preparation in general studies paper 2 under government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation. And also under important aspects of governance, transparency and accountability. Stepping into the main discussion. The news article states that Maharashtra is set to become the second state to implement the central government's interoperable criminal justice system, that is ICJS. This ICJS will act as a common platform for all government agencies to share data about prisoners across the state. The first state in India to implement this system, that is the central government's interoperable criminal justice system is Telangana in December 2018. The interoperable criminal justice system aims to integrate the CCTNS project with the e-courts and e-prisons databases in the first phase and then with the other pillars of the criminal justice system which includes forensics, prosecution, juvenile homes and a nationwide fingerprint database of criminals in a phased manner. This project will be implemented by the Ministry of Home Affairs. With the introduction of this project, the courts can consume live data of FIR and charge sheet from police. If FIR is ready in electronic form in the electronic system of police, ICGS interface will indicate to the court about the readiness of the FIR data that is to be consumed by the court. On consumption, the court will get details of FIR number, names of accused, details of the offence, time, date, place of occurrence, details of arrest, etc. Courts will be able to consume this live electronic data from police. In reciprocation, the courts will send all remand details, bail details, property release, etc. to police. Police will be able to see the updates of each FIR and will also be able to see orders passed by the court in remand, bail or release of property. Thus, it ensures interoperability, that is to exchange and make use of the information available between two or more stakeholders. Some of the advantages of this interoperable criminal justice system are that it would ensure justice delivery in a fast and an efficient manner. Next advantage is that the time and manpower taken currently to do the manual work of shifting the files from police station to the court and backwards will be completely saved. The introduction of interoperable criminal justice system will bring transparency in criminal justice delivery. We saw that interoperable criminal justice system will integrate CCTNS system with various other systems. Let us know about CCTNS system in brief. CCTNS stands for Crime and Criminal Tracking Network and Systems. It is implemented by the Ministry of Home Affairs. National Crime Records Bureau is also a stakeholder under this project. It was introduced as a mission mode project under National E-Governance Plan of the Government of India. Let us see the general purpose of implementing CCTNS on a pan-India basis. CCTNS has facilitated a pan-India search of crime and criminal records of individuals through a national database. It has computerized the police processes across all the states. CCTNS will provide citizen-centric police services via a web portal. Also, it would be possible to generate crime and criminal report data at the state and central level to inform policy interventions. With this, we come to the end of this discussion. The displayed prelims question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the last and final article for the day, which is about the new aircraft carrier of India. This article has appeared on page 7 of Delhi edition only. The information under this article is relevant in the preliminary examination under the area current events of national importance. And in main syllabus, it is relevant under GS paper 3 in the area indigenization of technology. The news article states about 
the Indian government's negotiation with United Kingdom on building a new aircraft carrier along the lines of Britain's HMS Queen Elizabeth, which is a British warship. And this will be built as a part of Make in India. Indian Navy will buy the plans for the British warship and the new copycat carrier will be named INS Vishal. If the deal is agreed, then the warship will be built in India in 2022. And the UK companies will supply the parts required for building the carrier. The report noted that the new naval carrier would serve alongside India's INS Vikramaditya and the currently under construction INS Vikrant and together all the three that is INS Vishal, INS Vikramaditya and INS Vikrant would give India a larger carrier fleet than Britain. Now let us know some facts about INS Vikramaditya and INS Vikrant in the prelims perspective. INS Vikramaditya is the largest ship to join Indian Navy on 16th November 2013. INS Vikramaditya was acquired from Russia for $2.3 billion. It was commissioned into the Navy in November 2013 without the crucial air defense systems. It is a modified Kaif class aircraft carrier of Russia. The Israeli supplied Barak 1 point defense missile system and the Russian origin AK-630 close-in weapon system is installed on Vikramaditya. It has a stow bar system that is short takeoff but assistive recovery system which is a aircraft launch and recovery system. Vikramaditya which is a floating airfield has an overall length equivalent to three football fields put together and standing about 20 stories tall from keel to the highest point. It is a 44,500 ton mega structure with over 1,600 personnel on board. Vikramaditya is literally a floating city with her complete stock of provisions. She is capable of sustaining herself at sea for a period of about 45 days. The ship has the ability to carry over 30 aircraft. Now let us see about INS Vikrant. The INS Vikrant derives its name from India's first majestic class aircraft carrier Hercules which was which was acquired from Britain in 1957 and commissioned in 1961 as INS Vikrant and later in 1997 it was decommissioned. In the naval traditions names of various ships are passed on to the successor vessels. The new INS Vikrant is an indigenous design of India. It has a short takeoff but assisted recovery that is Toba system like INS Vikramaditya and it can operate 20 fighter jets and 10 other aircraft. The design and construction of the indigenous aircraft carrier was sanctioned by the government in January 2003 and it is still under construction. INS Vikrant marks a special feather in indigenous defense capabilities as this being the first ever aircraft carrier to be designed by the Directorate of Naval Design of the Indian Navy and the first warship to be built entirely using indigenously produced steel. The successful completion of INS Vikrant will put India in the elite group of four nations in the world capable of designing and constructing aircraft carriers. Those four nations are US, Russia, the United Kingdom and France. With this we come to the end of discussion session. The display prelims question is a previously appeared question in preliminary examination and it has been provided for the benefit of the students. Let us move on to the last session for the day that is practice questions discussion session. The first question is consider the following statements. First statement maternal mortality rate refers to the number of maternal deaths per 1 lakh live births due to cases related to pregnancy which is regardless of the site or duration of pregnancy. Second statement the target for maternal mortality ratio is mentioned in the sustainable development goal 3 which is ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Which of the above statements is or are correct? Keep in mind we have to look for the correct statement. Here the first statement is correct as maternal mortality rate refers to the number of maternal deaths per 1 lakh live births due to cases related to pregnancy that is death while pregnant or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy which is regardless of the site or duration of pregnancy. This we already discussed in our analysis. The second statement is also correct as the target for maternal mortality ratio is mentioned in the sustainable development goal 3. The target is to reduce maternal mortality ratio to less than 70 deaths per 1 lakh live births by 2030. So the correct answer for this question is option C both 1 and 2. The second question is 
The term saccharin recently seen in news is related to which of the following? Option A, migratory bird. Option B, sweetening agent. Option C, vaccination. Option D, new element in periodic table. This is a very direct question. If you would have listened to our analysis very carefully, you know that saccharin is a sweetening agent. So, the correct answer is option B. Now, let us see another question in the same topic, saccharin. The question is, saccharin has applications in which of the following? First one, food and beverages. Second one, personal care products. Third one, reconstructive surgeries. Fourth one, pharmaceutical industry. Fifth one, electroplating brighteners. Select the correct answer using the code given below. So, we have to see which of the above are correct. We very well know from our discussion that saccharin applications in many industries such as pharmaceutical, food and beverages, personal care products, electroplating brighteners, etc. But it is not used in reconstructive surgery. So, the correct option for this question is option C, 1, 2, 4 and 5 only. The next question is which one of the following best describes the term anti-dumping duty sometimes seen in news. First statement, the duty levied on goods like tobacco, pan masala or any item that are harmful for health resulting from dumping of goods. Second statement, it is the duty imposed by the central government when a country is paying the subsidy to the exporters who are exporting goods to India. Third statement, it is the duty charged on goods on their importation or exportation out of India. Last statement, it is the duty charged on specified goods imported from specified countries to protect indigenous industry from unfair material injury resulting from dumping of goods. Here if you see, the term itself has anti-dumping duty. So, you have to look for the option which means dumping of goods. Here if you can see, option A and D both have dumping of goods. But the first statement states that it is the duty levied on goods which are harmful for health. So, we can eliminate that option. Uh, but the last statement states it is the duty charged on specified goods imported from specified countries to protect indigenous industry from unfair material injury. We have already discussed this part in our analysis. The, so, the correct option for this question is option D. Next question is consider the following statements. The central government has announced a new scheme in 2018 to 19 union budget named Samagra Siksha Abhyan. The scheme was introduced with an aim to treat school education holistically without segmentation from pre-nursery to class 12. This centrally sponsored scheme has subsumed which of the following schemes? First one, Rashtriya Madhyamik Siksha Abhyan. Next, Sakshar Bharat. Next, Sarva Siksha Abhyan. Next, Teacher Education. Choose the correct answer from the options given below. So, we have to choose which of the above schemes has been subsumed by Samagra Siksha Abhyan. We saw in our discussion that Sarva Siksha Abhyan, Rashtriya Mahadamik Siksha Abhyan and Teacher Education were subsumed by the Samagra Siksha Abhyan. So, the correct option is the option which contains 1, 3 and 4 that is option C. In this question, you can also use the method of elimination as we know option 2 is not a part of this scheme. So, you have to eliminate all the options which contain number 2 that is option A, B and D can be eliminated. So, from this we, we can directly get the answer option C. Next question is the interoperable criminal justice system aims to integrate the CCTNS project with which of the following? First one e-prisons database, next e-courts database, next juvenile homes, next forensics, next nationwide fingerprint database of criminals. Choose the correct answer from the option given below. As usual, we have to choose the correct answer only. From our discussion, we know that the interoperable criminal justice system aims to integrate the CCTNS project with the e codes and e prisons database in the first phase. So, first and second are definitely there. Then, we also saw that other pillars of criminal justice system are also included like forensics, prosecution, juvenile homes and a nationwide fingerprint database of criminals in a phased manner. So, here all the items are correct. Hence, the correct option to this question is option D, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Now, finally, let us see one main question. On May 3, 2019, Cyclone Fani brought havoc on the state of Odisha. Describe the efforts taken by the government in ensuring disaster risk reduction, particularly in loss of lives. List the focal areas for a government to concentrate in rebuilding the devastated state. 
for answering this question give information about cyclone phony in two or three lines then focus on describing the efforts taken by mentioning timely weather alerts preparedness and informed public participation that played a key role in reducing loss of lives you can highlight how the state upgraded itself after cyclone 05 b in 1999 for the second part list out the areas that has to be given immediate priority to rebuild for example the, in the author's point of view you may say restoring electricity and telecommunications rehabilitating the affected people then the new infrastructure shall be upgrading technology and by rebuilding resilience to extreme weather events with this we come to the end of question answer discussion session don't forget to like comment and share and subscribe to our shankar is academy youtube channel for more updates on upsc civil service examination preparation